John Collier Jr., The Art of Visual Anthropology, all photographs by John Collier Jr. unless otherwise noted. Presented by the Maxwell Museum of Anthropology at the University of New Mexico. In 2003, Mary E.T. Collier, widow of John Collier Jr. and Malcolm Collier, their son, donated the John Collier Jr. archive to the Maxwell Museum of Anthropology. Consisting of approximately 12,000 print photographs, 20,000 negatives, dozens of hours of film, and the papers of John and Mary, it is one of the largest and most important parts of the Maxwell's photo archive. In the context of a museum of anthropology, we are urged to put the utility of the photograph front and center and to look through the photograph at the evidence the image provides. However, while the beauty of an image may tell us little about its function, if we can think about form and style as just a small part of how an artful photograph operates, we stand to learn more not only about what the photograph says, but also how it speaks. Art historian Catherine Zaramskis. Early Life John Collier, Jr., born in 1913 to sociologist and one-time head of the Bureau of Indian Affairs, John Collier, grew up in two places. Owing to his father's work, his family split time between living in Mill Valley, California, and Taos, New Mexico. At the age of eight, Collier sustained a traumatic brain injury in a car crash and subsequently struggled with formal education. He took an interest in painting, and because of his struggles with traditional education related to his injuries at the age of 12, he began to informally apprentice with Western painter Menard Dixon, who was married to the photographer Dorothea Lang. As a teenager, Collier sometimes lived with Dixon and Lang, who introduced him to artists in both San Francisco and Taos, setting the stage for his early training in the visual arts and photography. When he was 16, Collier signed on as a seaman and sailed on a voyage from San Francisco around Cape Horn to Dublin, Ireland. After his stint at sea in the early 1930s, Collier worked as an apprentice in Taos for the photographer Paul Strand, whose photograph is pictured here. Strand's photography, like Lang's and other photographers and artists he was encountering, having an obvious influence on Collier's work, both in terms of aesthetics, as well as in terms of the consideration of social context found in the work of a growing number of photographers of the time. In 1939, after working for some time in San Francisco, Collier returned to Taos and using Strand's old darkroom as his own, Collier worked for some years as a photographer there. Also learning about studio and commercial photography from the Taos artists, husband and wife duo Sarah Higgins Mack and Robert Mack. During his time working in Taos, influenced by the many artists and socially conscious activists he came into contact with there, he began developing his own artistry and approach, taking many photographs of people and events of local interest in Taos. In the 1930s, Collier spent time in both New Mexico and California, freelancing with his photography before beginning his next chapter in life. FSA Photography In 1941, Collier was hired by the photographer Roy Stryker to work for the Farm Security Administration and the Office of War Information. FSA photography focused on civil defense and public morale, reflecting the idealism and humanism that Roy Stryker envisioned for the project. Photographers like Collier were hired for their ability to convey these values with their images. Sitting within this larger ideological framework, the images depicted individuals. Communities.
pounds. Worship. Rural life. Industry. Landscapes The years Collier spent working on the FSA project, working along other skilled photographers such as Dorothea Lang, Roy Stryker, Walker Evans, Russell Lee, Jack Delano, and many more, deepened his artistic sensibilities and technical skill. Otavalo, Ecuador. In 1945, after a year's stint in the Merchant Marine, Collier was hired as a photographer by Stryker for the Standard Oil Company in the Canadian Arctic and later in Latin America, capturing the lives of oil workers and local peoples. While in Ecuador in 1946, Collier took leave from his Standard Oil Company position to work with his wife, Mary E. Collier, and anthropologist Anibel Buitron, Ecuador's first professionally trained anthropologist, to study the Andean Indians of Otavalo, Ecuador. Mary E. Collier collaborated often with her husband, but has often gone uncredited and unrecognized for her contributions to the work produced. Together, Collier, his wife, and Buitron and his wife, Barbara Salisbury Buitron, studied the indigenous inhabitants of Otavalo in the Andean highlands of Ecuador. Observing, through means of interaction, note-taking, and of greatest interest here, the taking of photographs, daily life, ceremonial and special occasions, and the impact of the introduction of commercial weaving, among other things. In this collaborative project, Anibal Buitron did the ethnology, his wife translated, and the Colliers took all the photographs. This work culminated in the visual anthropology book, The Awakening Valley, a photographic record of the Indians of the Atabalo Valley in Ecuador, published in 1949. This book is important for any number of reasons, not the least of which is because it could be considered the first visual anthropology publication. Nova Scotia, Navajo Nation. In 1950, Collier joined a project at Cornell University with the medical doctor and psychiatrist turned anthropologist Alexander Layton, doing ethnographic research in Digby County, Nova Scotia. For this project, Collier took images of traditional industries such as fishing, agriculture, logging, and family businesses as well as documenting social and religious events, schools, churches, housing, and general views and landscapes, in many ways echoing Collier's earlier work for the FSA. Subsequent to this study in Nova Scotia a few years later, the two undertook together a study for Cornell on the Navajo Nation, where again Collier documented mid-20th century life on the Navajo Nation as he had done numerous other times as a photographer in New Mexico. Venezuela and Peru. In 1952, Collier returned to South America to work in Venezuela and Peru with his family following shortly thereafter. In Venezuela, Collier took pictures for the Standard Oil Company again a project headed as it had been earlier by his former FSA boss, Roy Stryker. 
Two years later, Mary and the Collier's sons rejoined John in Peru. As they joined the Cornell San Marcos project, which would become controversial over time due to the heavily interventive nature of its applied anthropology approach. John and Mary were also joined in the documenting and photographing of peoples in the Andes by Abraham Julian, an important Peruvian photographer. This Cold War era project, which billed itself as a modernization experiment, was in keeping with Collier's interest in applied anthropology. The project promoted and initiated changes in the communities it studied. Often in a paternalistic and unwanted way, which could play out to the detriment of the people who live there. Nevertheless, over a period of a year, the team took approximately 10,000 photographs. In several hours of 16 millimeter motion picture film. However, Collier's contract on the project was cut short and the family, running out of money, returned to the United States with reportedly $12 to their name. Visual Anthropology In the late 50s and 60s, Collier continued to conceptualize the practice of visual anthropology, which culminated in his 1967 publication, Visual Anthropology, Photography as a Research Method. Two years later, in 1969, Collier returned to making motion pictures, taking part in a national study of Native American education, filming in Alaska, Arizona, and California. John Collier Jr. continued to be a pioneer in visual anthropology and a promoter of alternative education, teaching, photographing, and filming work he continued to do until the end of his life in 1992, with his wife Mary, his constant collaborator. The larger body of Collier's work, if observed through the lens of his own imperatives, was meant to be illustrative of cultural expression. And yet his photographs are both technically skilled and almost always captivating. His work often straddles the structures and goals of both fine art photography and ethnographic photography. In this way, his photographs surpass many other field photographs taken by anthropologists and ethnographers over the years. This exhibition is about the collection of John Collier Jr.'s work in the Maxwell Museum of Anthropology Photo Archive and it is meant to introduce you not only to what his photographs can tell us about human cultures, but also to encourage you to question how these images are telling us something about the cultures he photographed. It is also an introduction to a collection that is a rich resource too underutilized up to this point. And we invite those of you who have interest to undertake research on this invaluable collection the largest collection of papers and photographs of Mary and John Collier, Jr.